Hello, everybody, and welcome to the next lecture of 683A. It's a pleasure to see you online again. Uh, today, we're going to be continuing in our ping pong back and forth between discrete and smooth geometry. Today, we're going to do discrete geometry and talk about how we can actually approximate curvature on triangulated meshes. Now, remember that in our previous lecture, we developed a nice theory of how curvature might work on a smooth surface. Today, we're going to cover the more practical aspects of how to actually compute values like principal curvatures and principal directions when you're just given a big pile of triangles linked together into a manifold structure. So to start, we'll do a little bit of review from last time, and then we're going to dive right into the different algorithms that people use in this domain. So if you'll recall from our previous lecture, the basic point was that at every point on a two-dimensional surface embedded in 3D, we can compute two really critical values. This was the Gaussian curvature, like what we have on the left, and the mean curvature, like what we have on the right. Uh, and very roughly, Gaussian curvature is what we use to distinguish between you know, bowl-shaped surfaces and hyperbolic ones, whereas mean curvature uh, is the average of the two principal curvatures and tells us something about the, uh, the magnitude, as well as how surface area changes as I modify my, my surface. And if you watch the extra lecture video uh, material, then you even saw a different motivation of mean curvature that came directly from uh, taking the gradient of the surface area functional. So in practice, these are not just two interesting numbers one might compute on a surface. They actually show up all over different applications and for many different reasons. So for example, one very typical thing to do is to use the Gaussian or mean curvature as descriptors on a surface. Now, this term descriptor is going to show up a lot in 6838. The basic point here is that if I pick a location on a 3D surface, like this dragon here, then the mean curvature and the Gaussian curvature are like two scalar measurements that I can take that tell me something about the geometry of the surface near those points. So for example, if I had a second scan of the same dragon model, maybe I try to match points from one dragon to the other by saying that they should have similar uh, curvature values. So using curvature as a descriptor is one of these really old and useful ideas that's been around for a long time. Descriptors uh, in machine learning, sometimes we call them features, are also useful, for example, for identifying different segments on your surface, like maybe the eyes of a 3D model tend to be concave and other parts of a 3D model tend to be hyperbolic, um, and, and many other applications. But that's not the only place where curvature appears. So for example, one theorem that we mentioned but we didn't prove in the last lecture is that if you know the first and second fundamental forms of a surface, then you can often reconstruct that surface. So there's kind of an interesting pipeline that you can use for editing, deforming, smoothing out uh, meshes in computer graphics by essentially computing the fundamental form associated to your input data surface, editing it in some way, for example, smoothing out the geometry that it kind of encodes, and then reconstructing the domain again. So here on the slide, I've given you one reference to an earlier uh, piece of research that attempts to do this, and, and many other papers uh, in, in, in surface editing, smoothing, uh, deformation, and so on can be interpreted through this lens. In fact, one of the extremely uh, famous applications of mean curvature is as a smoothing functional. So recall that uh, when we talked about mean curvature in the previous little piece of extra lecture material, one of many ways to understand mean curvature is that it's sort of the gradient of surface area, at least the mean curvature weighted normal to the surface. So this actually has application in smoothing uh, surfaces out because essentially we can understand smoothing as uh, uh, decreasing the surface area in many cases. Uh, so for example, here's sort of a one-dimensional analog. Suppose that I have a curve that's really wobbly like that, and I want to smooth my curve out. Well, one thing that I could do is think of this curve like a piece of string and pull it tight, right? So in other words, to replace that wobbly curve with a straight line, right? So the straight line has less arc length than the wobbly curve. And so indeed, one way to understand the smoothing problem is locally to maybe decrease the arc length of a curve or to decrease the surface area of a surface. Uh, and so this sort of led to using mean curvature flow as a way to smooth out noisy data. So what you would do is maybe compute this vector field, which is telling you locally how to decrease 
in the one-dimensional case, arc length, and then in the two-dimensional case, surface area, and then solve a differential equation that flows your curve or your surface along that vector field to slowly smooth out the rough features. Because again, rough features add a lot of arc length or surface area. Uh, and so that's, that motivated this early work on um, implicit fairing or surface smoothing, which actually is roughly similar to the surface smoothing methods that we use today. They really haven't changed all that much. So let me erase real quick. OK. So another application of curvature uh, appears in the non-photorealistic rendering domain. Uh, so a lot of non-photorealistic rendering techniques actually make use of principal curvature directions and, and curvature values to guide the rendering process. So non-photorealistic rendering is essentially a technique where you try to render a 3D surface by highlighting the interesting parts or trying to make it look like a sketch or something like that, rather than actually simulating light bouncing around in the universe. And uh, so here we see an example of that. This is a, obviously not a rendering that's intended to look like shading um, from light bouncing around in a scene. And one of the typical things that we do is use the principal curvatures and principal directions to identify interesting feature curves that are worth highlighting on the uh, domain. So maybe you think of ridge curves, which are like principal curves along directions of maximal curvature locally, as things that maybe are worth highlighting when you render by drawing curves along those directions. Uh, there are other algorithms out there, for example, that try to do hatch marks on surfaces, uh, you know, similar to old school cartoons. And uh, one of the main ways that people use to guide the directions of the hatch marks is to make them roughly parallel to the principal directions, maybe after some smoothing because they, they tend to be a little noisy. Uh, yet another application of very similar machinery is in meshing. So uh, for example, here uh, is one of the early quad meshing algorithms, uh, or really polygonal remeshing, because sometimes you don't end up with quads. Uh, where essentially what they did is they take an input triangular mesh and the desired output is a simplified mesh that's composed of quadrilateral elements, or at least principally composed of quad elements. And so one algorithm for doing that essentially extracts direction fields like little plus signs moving along the mesh and then tries to place the uh, quadrilaterals in a way that's aligned to those direction fields. Uh, and one of the simplest direction fields that you can use is the principal curvatures along your mesh. And that sort of makes sense. So for example, on a cylindrical surface, the uh, principal directions are going to point parallel to the cylinder and around the uh, outer circle. So uh, this is sort of suggestive of a pretty reasonable set of directions for laying out your mesh edges. Now, in this domain, one of the big challenges is integrability, right? The, like, for instance, if I just trace one of these principal direction fields, I don't necessarily have them make a closed loop, like they might spiral up a uh, cylindrical surface a little bit, and that wouldn't make for a very good set of mesh edges. So a bit of repair and smoothing and uh, approximation has to happen uh, in order for these algorithms to work. And actually, uh, just for fun, I'll show you, this is a special topic for me. Uh, so back in high school, uh, the reason that I got into geometry processing, I had an internship, you know, kind of sharpening pencils and writing little bits of code uh, in a uh, laboratory that was implementing a curvature-based 3D face recognition technique. Uh, I think the face recognition universe has moved by leaps and bounds since uh, I worked on it gosh, many years ago, uh, but <laughs> I got a, a little patent out of it. So if you search on Google, uh, uh, you know, in the Google patent search, you'll find that your course instructor, I believe, basically owns a patent on Gaussian curvature or something. <laughs> but in any event, the big challenge when we're talking about applications of Gaussian curvature, mean curvature, principal curvatures, principal directions, is illustrated on this mesh here. Now, Recall that curvature is some kind of a second derivative quantity. Why do I say that? Well, we had one derivative by computing the surface normal, right? That came from the tangent plane. And then we talked about the second fundamental form as the derivative of the surface normal, right? It came from the shape operator. So somehow, in order to compute curvature, it feels like we need at least two derivatives on our surface. But unfortunately for us, surfaces like the solvent here are piecewise flat. And 
Indeed, you know, if you take a magnifying glass to most parts of this dolphin here, it just looks like a plane, right? Kind of alternates between being a plane and some singularity. Now, this is a very familiar story to us. It's exactly the same story that we told uh, when we talked about polyline curves for the one-dimensional case. But indeed, this is really something that we have to contend with. We're trying to approximate a second derivative quantity, but so far the formulas that we have on hand really don't do that. They only, they, 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 or, or rather, they don't have a good way to express when all you have is, is, is one derivative information, like tangent planes. So we're going to talk about a number of different approximations of curvature in today's lecture. What we're going to see, just like the usual no free lunch theme that we've talked about before, is that there are many different ways to approach curvature computation on a triangle mesh, and they all lead you to different quantities. Now, some of these quantities might be more stable or resilient to noise. Other quantities might conserve beautiful structures from differential geometry. And as usual, it's very rare that we can have one approximation that everybody agrees on. There's no free lunch here. So we'll start with one of the oldest and best known approximations of uh, curvature on a triangulated surface. This was uh, proposed all the way back in 1995, the early days of geometry processing, but it's still one of the easier to implement techniques and actually works fairly well in practice. Um, so it's worth uh, talking about a little bit. This is due to uh, Tobin, uh, who was at IBM Research at the time. So the way that Tobin went about approximating curvature was kind of interesting. And we're going to dive into some of the details of his technique. Here's the basic point. So, let me draw a little bit of, of a picture just so we remember our notation here. So here's our favorite little schematic for a 3D surface. And as always, we'll have some point P. And P has a tangent plane nearby, right? So that's T, P of M, if the name of our surface is M. OK, so what Tobin is going to do is, in this algorithm, he draws a unit circle around P. Okay, and looks at different tangent vectors t theta in that unit circle. Now, in general, he chooses t theta uh, based on some angle away from the uh, principal directions, t min and t max. But obviously, we don't know those yet. <laughs> so what we're going to see is that the, the angle of theta here is kind of arbitrary. Really, this is just integration over a circle that, that matters. But in any event, he derives this, defines this interesting matrix m sub p uh, which operates on the tangent plane. So what's going into m sub p? Well, we choose some direction t theta in our tangent plane. And now we take the outer product of t theta times t theta transpose. One thing, just as a sanity check, remember that, uh, well, t theta is a tangent vector, right? So it's in R3, right? It's a three-dimensional vector. So if we have t theta times, oops, uh, let me see if I can rescue that, t theta transpose, well, so this is a 3 by 1 matrix multiplied by a 1 by 3 matrix. So this is a 3 by 3 matrix. OK? So t theta, t theta transpose here is a rank 1, uh, 1 by 3 matrix, or 3 by 3 matrix. And then he weights that by the directional curvature in the t theta direction and integrates over the circle. So this is like a big average of rank 1 matrices weighted by directional curvature. So the kind of amazing thing that Tobin derived, I actually don't know how he came across this kind of interesting observation, is that if you construct this matrix at a point P, you can actually prove a really nice fact, which is that the eigenvectors of this matrix are the surface normal and the two principal directions. Remember the directions of minimum and maximum curvature and that the eigenvalues of this matrix are these funny formulas that I've put on the slide. 3 eighths times the min curvature plus 1 eighth times the max curvature, and then the other way around with the weightings. Now, I actually put on your homework uh, to prove this little formula. It's really just a byproduct of this integral, the way that it's written. Um, so remember that we have this useful formula for k theta that I put on the previous slide, right? That it's k min times cosine squared of theta plus k max times sine squared of theta. So essentially, you'll just plug that formula in for k theta. And then similarly for t theta, stir the pot, and you can uh, prove the formulas on the next slide. So it's just a, a straightforward calculation. There's, there's nothing too complicated.
Okay, but Tobin's uh, big observation was that this matrix is actually fairly straightforward to approximate at a vertex on a triangulated surface. And so that's how he goes about computing principal curvatures and directions, is he approximates MP at each vertex and then computes its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And the three eigenvectors are the surface normal and the two principal directions. So let's dive into precisely how Tobin goes about approximating this matrix M sub P. So unsurprisingly, uh, Tobin takes an integral from minus pi to pi here. Again, remember that's just an integral over a unit circle in the tangent plane. And he replaces it with the sum over outgoing edges from a given vertex. Okay, so the basic point here is that we're going to have a weight, W, some curvature estimate, kappa, right? That's, that's our, our standard for kappa sub theta. And then some tangent vector estimate, T. And then we're just going to cook those all together into one big sum. And so here, this, uh, this squiggly line I'm using to denote adjacent, right? So the point is that the matrix M at vertex V is a sum over all of the adjacent vertices U of this expression, right? So if I have, you know, here's V, and I have some set of neighbors like that. And it's going to iterate over each of the neighbors U and plug in some formula. OK, so essentially what we need to do is fill in each of these little pieces here, W, kappa, T. So let's do that. Now, Tobin essentially builds his version of kappa using a really clever little approximation of directional curvature on a smooth surface, which I think is just a really nice uh, 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 technique here. So let's go back to the smooth domain. And one thing that we're going to do is we're going to write yet another formula for surface curvature that is convenient for the approximation on the previous slide. But now our goal is not to compute principal curvatures or principal directions, but rather to approximate this directional curvature value. And remember from our previous lecture exactly what directional curvature is. It's um, you take a curve on your surface through the point P, you compute the curvature vector of the curve, but then you just look at the component of that in the normal direction to the surface. And that's how we got this uh, kappa sub theta value. OK, so remember that our surface is M. And as almost all of our arguments in this course go, we're going to start with a curve through our point P uh, that goes in the correct uh, direction. And we're going to start doing some calculations. OK? So, we're going to say that we're going to take uh, some curve gamma of s, right, which uh, goes from, uh, I don't know, some tiny interval, doesn't really matter, into our surface. Uh, oops, uh, well, it goes into R3, but really it goes into our surface M. And uh, moreover, uh, with, uh, you know, gamma at time zero is going to go through our point, and uh, gamma prime of zero, we'll just be sloppy and say is uh, in the uh, direction of theta. Okay. Right, so essentially, uh, remember that this uh, kappa sub theta value here uh, can be obtained by taking the second derivative of uh, our curve here, and then taking the dot product of that at s equals 0 uh, with the surface normal. Okay? And by the way, I forgot here, but we're going to assume here that our curve is parametrized by our length. Right? I put the s there, but I should, I should call that out. Okay. So now we're going to make kind of a Taylor series style argument. So in particular, Here's what we can do. We're going to take a Taylor series about the point s equals 0. What do we get in that case? Well, we get that gamma of s is equal to, well, the first term we can write is gamma of 0, which is just p. Yeah. And then what do we get next? Well, the next term we get is the linear term. Well, what is the first derivative of gamma at s equals 0? Well, remember that gamma is parametrized by arc length. 
right? So the derivative is the unit tangent to our curve. So we can say plus t of 0 times s. OK. And now, uh, now what? Well, the next thing that we're going to get is the second order term. So we get a 1 half. And what's the second derivative of our curve? Well, remember that that is the curvature uh, uh, normal to our curve. So we can write that as follows. We can say, uh, we'll say that's maybe k gamma of 0 times the normal at 0 times s squared. And we're not going to worry about higher order terms, right? It, it, when we've talked about curve geometry so far, it's basically just been up to that term in the Taylor series. So we'll have plus big O of s cubed. OK, so hopefully uh, this Taylor series expression doesn't come as a su surprise at this point. This is just the same kind of stuff that we've already been written, writing many times in, in this course. OK, so in particular, we can subtract p off from both sides. So, so let's go ahead and do that. And um, what we're going to get is, uh, well, basically the same expression with p moved to the other side. Yeah, so that's gamma of s minus p is equal to t of 0 times s plus 1 half the curvature of the curve at gamma of 0, n of 0, s squared plus order s cubed. OK. So now we're going to derive two more useful uh, formulas that are basically just byproducts of this Taylor expansion here. OK? And both of those are going to come from this formula. So the first thing that we can do is we can take the dot product of this expression with itself. So in other words, we can compute um, gamma of s minus p, the two norm squared, right? That's exactly the same as taking a vector and dotting it with itself. OK, so what's going to end up happening? Well, now we've got these three terms dot producted with the same three terms. Your instructor is going to be lazy. I don't feel like copying down this expression another two times. So remember what happens when you do that, right? You can um, essentially, you know, binomial your way out of this problem. So the first term you'll get is t naught s dot product t naught s. OK, so t naught is a unit vector. So t of 0 dot product with itself is just 1, right? So this is actually s squared like that. And now I'm going to do something incredibly lazy, which is, what is the dot product of this first term with any other one of these terms? Well, if we think about it, this guy already has an s here. And the other two have s squared and s cubed, right? So in particular, if I take the dot product of the first term with any of the other ones, I'm going to get at least uh, an s uh, squared. Or sorry, at least, well, uh, right, so an s cubed, right? So there's s cubed, s to the fourth. And in fact, that's true for all the remaining terms, right? This is s to the fourth, s to the fifth, s to the sixth. So in particular, I can write plus big O of s cubed. By the way, when I say big O, I mean the Taylor series big O, like something, you know, the rate at which it vanishes as s goes to 0. I don't mean the computer science big O, like how fast it explodes as s gets big. OK. The other thing that I can do is I can take the same expression here, and I can multiply, or rather dot product that expression with the surface normal. OK, not the, uh, not the um, curve normal, but the surface normal. OK, so when I do that, what am I going to get? Well, I'll get, in fact, just for convenience, I'm going to put a 2 in front of it also. So I'm going to have 2 times the surface normal at p dot producted with gamma of s minus p, like that. And what do I get? Well, the surface normal dot product t of 0, well, this is in the tangent plane, and this is the surface normal. So those two things are orthogonal. OK, so that's good. That's our, our first step. Now, what's the second thing? So the 2 cancels with the 1 half. So you're going to get the dot product between the surface normal and the normal to the, the curvature normal to the curve. Well, that 
is exactly the number that we're trying to approximate, right? So that is equal to k theta uh, times, uh, we have an s squared here. And finally, what do we get? Well, we have, you know, just this cubic term that we don't know what to do with. So big O of s cubed again. Aha! Now this was sneaky because we have this kappa theta sitting here, and remember that is the value that we're after at the end of the day. <laughs> so now he's hiding here. We just have to expose him in terms of things that we can plausibly approximate on a triangulated mesh. And so, of course, that isn't terribly difficult. Uh, so so let's, let's do that. In particular, we can do a little bit of rearrangement on this expression. And what are we going to find? We're going to find that uh, kappa theta is equal to, well, I'm going to divide everything by s squared, right? So I have 2np transpose times gamma of s minus p divided by uh, s squared. Uh, right, and now we have a big O of s cubed, but I divided by s squared, so we have big O of s like that. Okay, but conveniently for us, we have a s squared <laughs> right there. Okay, so now we're going to plug this expression in, right? So again, s squared is equal to the left-hand side here plus big O of s cubed. Okay, so this is uh, the numerator again, 2np transpose gamma of s minus p and divided by our expression for s squared, which is the norm of gamma of s minus p uh, squared. And now there's a little bit of a mathematical sleight of hand that we have to make. So um, this is plus big O of s cubed, and then this whole expression is plus big O of s. Now, one thing that we can show uh, is, is kind of a convenient thing, um, which is an extension of a theorem that you might know from high school, uh, which is the following. If I write a over b plus s, and I take the Taylor series of this expression in s, what I'm going to get, well, the zeroth order term is simple enough, it's just a over b, and then plus big O of s. Technically now this big O is kind of hiding constants involving the other values, and at least the original analysis of this algorithm admittedly kind of disregards that. I, I don't know if careful analysis here would be useful or not. But the, the basic point is that um, by this little formula that we've written here, we can take this s cubed and essentially absorb it into our s term here. So in other words, this is 2np transpose gamma of s minus p, all this divided by gamma of s minus p, 2 norm squared, plus big O of s. And I only did like a few mathematically shameful things to, to get here. <laughs> okay, um, so there's our, our kind of convenient expression for uh, directional curvature because if you look, if I have a triangle mesh where I give all of the triangle vertices uh, normal directions, which is a pretty typical thing to come out of a piece of graphics software, which is to say not just a triangle mesh, but also uh, the normal to the surface at every vertex. This is also something that's easy enough to approximate in assorted ways, for example, by taking the average triangle normal adjacent to that vertex. Well, then what do we have? We, we have the normal vector. We can think of like gamma minus p as roughly a vector along an edge of the mesh. So essentially, the kind of clever observation in this algorithm is that every single term in this first order approximation is computable on a triangular mesh. This is a really clever technique. Okay, so what does Tobin's algorithm actually do? Well, uh, it looks something like this. So hopefully this actually fits. I apologize, the slide comes on top of a bit of my writing here, but I think that's okay. Um, so essentially, the approximation that gets made in this technique is this sum that we had on the, the earlier slide, but now we have a reasonable formula for the unit tangent and curvature. So the curvature 
kappa vu here is exactly an application of this formula, where all we've done is just plug in the two vertex positions and, uh, you know, gotten rid of the uh, big O of, of S here. And the T V U term, so this is supposed to be the tangent in the V U direction. Essentially, all that goes on in this formula, which I'm now noticing is missing a parenthesis, I apologize, um, is essentially just taking the vector, you know, between uh, U and V and projecting it onto the plane orthogonal to N. Okay, so there's one additional piece missing in this algorithm, which I didn't give you, which are the weights. One easy set of weights would be just one over the valence of my vertex, but uh, rather than doing that, um, essentially there's, there's a slightly nicer weight which accounts for the size of the, the triangle areas. So, so given the triangles, for example, what's shown on the slide, a, a totally reasonable weight, W, V, U, would just be essentially taking, you know, at least proportionally, to one half the area of triangle one plus the area of triangle two. Now, essentially, I'm just saying proportional because at the end of the day, I want my weights to sum up to one, right? So maybe I compute these for all of the outgoing edges from uh, vertex V here, and then I divide it by the sum. But anyway, that's, that's just basically a heuristic thing, saying that like if an edge is adjacent to two really big triangles, maybe it gets a bigger weight. But in any event, the, uh, the Tobin approximation of curvature is really pretty straightforward, right? The idea is that we have this clever first order approximation of directional curvature, which at least on a pretty dense triangle mesh will be a, a pretty reasonable value. That's the kappa thing. T, the way that we're obtaining the tangent is just by projecting the edge of the mesh onto the direction orthogonal to the vertex normal. And then we just take a weighted sum of that in the one ring and what we get out is this matrix M. And then finally, to recover the principal curvatures and principal directions, we use that formula on the previous slide. So we essentially compute the eigenvectors, eigenvalues of M, and uh, we have all the information that we need. So there's our first approximation of uh, principal directions, principal curvatures, and from those you can get Gaussian curvature and mean curvature pretty easily. Uh, and you can see that it's actually pretty straightforward to implement. It just required a little bit of math. Okay, I'm hiding behind this wall of math here, so let's pause and, and erase for a second. Okay, so there we have it. Um, there's the uh, first method that we've managed to propose in this course for actually approximating curvature on a triangulated domain. Now, one big challenge with this technique and many of its peers is that local estimates of curvature are quite noisy. Um, so if you take a look at this sort of zoomed in figure of a surface, the surface has some slight issues with the way that it's approximated. Um, so some of the vertices are perturbed a little bit up and down. And you can see that the curvature directions that you get out of this technique end up being a little wobbly and skew from each other, even if the surface standing back a little farther is, is probably some smooth object. Now, this is a really fundamental issue with curvature approximation, just generally speaking. And the reason that I say that is, again, curvature is a derivative quantity, right? So if I zoom in really close to the surface, there's almost a philosophical question I have to answer, right? Like, is this local noise due to the fact that the surface has a lot of curvature, really, in some tiny neighborhood? Or is it just due to the fact that I made a bad approximation? Um, and, and either one of these are, are, are perfectly reasonable uh, conclusions, but you have to choose uh, which one. And this is some trade-off between the stability of your curvature approximation and the fidelity to the local approximation. So for example, you could plausibly take the computation we just did and do it in the two ring of every vertex to get a larger neighborhood and stabilize your local estimate. Uh, and plenty of methods out there do things like this, like maybe fit a surface to local patches of the geometry and then use the curvature of that smoothed out surface as a proxy for the curvature of the uh, mesh. Now, in general, this Tobin algorithm that we've, we've started with is suggestive of a general strategy that people use for computing curvature on triangulated surfaces. That essentially what you do is you Start with a triangulated mesh, and now around every vertex, you collect some interesting information. Like for instance, the Tobin method, we kind of assembled that matrix M out of vertices and normals. And then you do a little bit of a computation and you pull the curvature value back out. Uh, 
And essentially for every kind of cute differential ge geometry formula out there for Gaussian curvature, mean curvature, principal direction, and so on, there probably exists some curvature approximation on a triangle mesh that tries to make that smooth formula work on the discrete domain. So as a little bit of a warning, there's definitely an overlap here between engineering and uh, math. You know, at the end of the day, you want a curvature approximation that's stable and has some fidelity to the smooth case. Um, and, and those two things are fighting against each other. And so essentially, there's kind of a fun thing that you can do, which is massage your favorite formula for curvature and then discretize it. So essentially, you get to do a little bit of smooth math and a little bit of discrete math. And the different points at which then transition happens represent different algorithms for curvature computation. So essentially, when we're talking about a, applications of curvature, a pretty easy takeaway from the literature and even from our discussion today is going to be that the application motivates which curvature formula is the most useful. Uh, and in fact, that's a theme that's going to happen throughout this course. And it's almost a little bit surprising, right, that like we don't always want the best approximation of curvature as we refine our mesh. Maybe what we really care about is stability, for example, because we have noisy data. Um, and that is going to lead us to a very different formula than what we might have done otherwise in some other domain, like non-photorealistic rendering, where your data tends to be like some very smooth, dense approximation of a surface that was engineered by an artist. So let's think about a different example. Um, this is another one of these early techniques for curvature computation that uh, in this case was uh, proposed by Simon Rusinkiewicz in, in 2004. Uh, so this algorithm approximates curvature, actually, and its derivative along triangulated surfaces with the motivation of non-photorealistic rendering. So you can even see on the right-hand side that they're using uh, some of the curvature lines to make interesting highlights on a uh, pen and ink style drawing of the 3D uh, model. So whereas the previous algorithm constructed sort of a bespoke matrix that suited its algorithm, uh, the algorithm in this particular research paper actually works from one of the objects that we constructed in our previous lecture, and that is the second fundamental form. So we thought about the second fundamental form as an operator, right? It took in two vectors and then output um, the shape operator evaluated in one vector direction, dot product with the other vector uh, with the minus sign in front of it. But we can also think of the second fundamental form as sort of a two by two matrix. So in particular, if we take some orthonormal basis u comma v for the tangent plane to a surface, then essentially the second fundamental form only really has four interesting values. And those are given in the slide here. I'm realizing, by the way, that there, I, I, I made a sign mistake. I think there actually depends on which uh, textbook you use, uh, whether uh, the second fundamental form has a plus sign or a minus sign <laughs> uh, in front of it. So I, I apologize for that. But in any event, <laughs> or if you oriented your surface the other way by flipping the normal, then I suppose you'd flip the sign of this matrix. But ignoring the sign for now, essentially in uh, this particular technique for computing curvature, there's kind of a clever trick that happens. So now, the idea is that we make this two by two matrix where we've evaluated the second fundamental format, u comma u, u comma v, v comma u, v comma v. Now take any arbitrary vector w in the tangent plane at the same point. Well, w can be written as a linear combination of our two basis vectors u and v. And because of that, now one thing that you can work out pretty easily is if I take the second fundamental form with this sign convention, <laughs> sorry, and multiply it by this uh, c1, c2 vector, what I'll end up getting is the coefficients of the uh, shape operator evaluated at our arbitrary vector w uh, written in the u comma v basis, right? So that was a lot of words, but if you kind of stare at the equations here, I think you'll agree they're, they're pretty straightforward linear algebra. There's really nothing complicated going on here. It's just making use of the linearity of the differential and the linearity of dot products. That's all. Okay, so in this algorithm for approximating curvature, now we're going to discretize it per triangle on our mesh rather than per vertex. So here's the basic idea. Well, one thing that we've done now is we, we've shown how to evaluate the shape operator 
in the C1, C2 direction and getting the change in normal vector. Well, okay, if I have an oriented triangle mesh and every single vertex of my oriented triangle mesh is accompanied with a normal vector, well, now I have a way of approximating the second fundamental form times the difference, uh, you know, like the edge vector along each of the three edges of the triangle. Right? So, for example, if we take a look at the first expression on this slide, what is it saying? Well, e0 dot u, e0 dot v, that's like taking the edge e0 on the right here and writing it in this uv coordinate system, right? That's all it is. And based on the previous slide, if I take my second fundamental form and I multiply it by this two by one vector, what I get on the right hand side of this expression is just the change in normal vector direction also written in the UV basis. So I can do that with each of the three edges of my triangle, and conveniently we can do a tiny bit of degree of freedom counting here. So the uh, second fundamental form has three degrees of freedom, right? It's a symmetric two by two matrix when you write it in the UV basis. And now how many pieces of information do I have? Well, I have one, two, three, four, five, six uh, pieces of information. Okay. So what we can do is write down these three expressions approximated on our mesh, and then solve a least squares problem to recover the second fundamental form uh, matrix. So basically, it's just some function of these uh, three expressions here. That's all. And so what does that give you? That gives you a second fundamental form matrix per triangle of our mesh. Um, Ruzinkevich essentially proposes uh, doing the following. This is where the engineering really happens. To make the uh, approximation a little more resilient to noise, he averages the per triangle second fundamental forms back to the vertices, kind of using a weighting scheme similar to Tobin's method. Um, this is less important. This is just whether you want uh, that two matrix per triangle or per vertex. So the per triangle approximations on the previous slide, and then to get it per vertex, all he does is just basically add them up and divide by n in the one ring of, of every vertex. And what you get is a fairly stable second fundamental form matrix because it's sort of averaging a bunch of times around a vertex. And so there's a bit of destructive interference that can happen that can reduce noise. So that's just a second representative method. If you go onto your favorite search engine and you search for uh, curvature on a triangle mesh, there'll be a ton of different things that come up. And essentially, they're all just making use of different formulas for curvature. So for example, here's one that makes use of the uh, curvature in the fundamental forms of a height function. So they express a surface locally as a graph over some plane, and then they plug in this formula. Um, there are other uh, algorithms out there that are using larger neighborhoods, maybe fitting surfaces to collections of vertices. There's no shortage of, 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 of curvature computation methods. If you in 20, uh, what year is it, 2021, set out to write a research paper on the latest algorithm for curvature computation on a triangle mesh, you better have a good reason because there really are so many approximations that are already available. Okay, so I would characterize the algorithms that we've talked about so far as discretized algorithms, right? We haven't really conserved any structure. We've kind of used Taylor series arguments to construct quantities that look like curvature as our mesh is refined. Um, but of course, if we want to follow in the philosophy of some of the methods that we developed for curves, maybe we try to come up with some interesting conserved structure from the smooth case when we discretize curvature onto a discrete domain. Now, there are many papers out there that try and do this. Uh, here, we'll talk about one particularly well-known one, which was one of the early papers in discrete differential geometry. So this is a paper from you know, Caltech and USC at the time uh, that covered discrete differential geometry operators for triangulated two manifolds, which are exactly the domains that we're talking about today. And they gave techniques for computing both Gaussian and mean curvature that are sort of built from smooth formulas adapted to the mesh domain in such a fashion that they preserve some of the properties exactly. So if you recall, the, the basic philosophical motivation between, behind methods like this is structure preservation. The idea is that there's so many interesting topological and geometric structures out there in the smooth theory of differential geometry. For example, like integrating the curvature of a plane curve and getting its winding number, that sometimes we can come up with discretizations of relevant quantities 
that actually conserve these theorems exactly, right? Like we had a discrete winding number theorem for our discrete curvature that truly integrated to 2 pi, where we kind of replace integral with sum over vertices. And now we're going to do something similar for curvature on a triangle mesh, which is a really nice sort of piece of gymnastics here. So in order to do that, unfortunately, I'm going to have to quote a theorem that we don't get to prove in our lecture. You know, the challenge with a course like this one is that we have to cover advanced differential geometry in half the time of a math course because we're also doing all this computational stuff. And so this is one of these examples of a theorem that, you know, we're going to omit the, the proof. So essentially, the theorem that we're going to use is something called the gauss bonnet theorem. And this is one of the crowning achievements in the differential geometry of two-dimensional surfaces. So here are surfaces M again. And the Gauss-Bonnet theorem is, is summarized in the formula that we have on the slide here. What it says is that if I integrate the Gaussian curvature of a surface, so this is a surface integral, like what you remember from calculus class, and I add to that the integral of the geodesic curvature of the boundary. So remember that the geodesic curvature is obtained by taking the curvature vector of our curve and projecting it onto the tangent plane. So we're going to uh, integrate that with respect to surface area around the boundary of our domain, then I actually get a topological invariant. I get 2 pi times the Euler characteristic of our domain M. And if you recall from a few lectures ago, um, the Euler characteristic is 2 minus 2 times the genus. And if you have a boundary, then it's also minus the number of, of boundary components N. So we're not going to be able to prove this uh, fact. It's an interesting fact to show uh, and sort of one of the crowning things in differential geometry, but it requires more work and, and a bit more sophisticated machinery than we currently have at our disposal in this course. But this is a beautiful kind of structure that we might want to preserve in our discrete differential geometry constructions, right? It says that there's some topological invariant of our domain, like the number of holes, that is expressed by summing up a bunch of curvature values which are just local derivatives. By the way, this is a surprising fact, right? This is not at all intuitive, at least for me, given the way that we define Gaussian curvature in this course. But what it's saying is that like, if I take a surface and I punch it like a piece of dough or stretch it out and fold it and so on, as long as I don't poke a hole in that surface, the total integrated Gaussian curvature remains the same, which is ridiculously interesting and cool. Okay, so the question is, can we come up with a Gaussian curvature measure that is associated to some discrete gauss binet theorem? And obviously the answer is yes, or else I, I wouldn't be talking to you today. Okay, so here's how we're going to do it. We're going to use a really sneaky trick. So uh, what we're going to do is draw a Voronoi cell around every vertex. And we're going to talk about curvature not as a point-by-point -point value, but rather integrated over the Voronoi cell. So the first thing that I have to do is define Voronoi cell. <laughs> and uh, the, you know, after that, um, we can start defining our, our curvature measure. So let's move our slide out of the way a little bit. Right, so first of all, what is a Voronoi cell? So the idea of a Voronoi cell is that, uh, like let's say that I have a uh, point on a triangle mesh, and I want to know the cell associated to that point. So maybe I write V sub P, then I'm going to define that to be the set of points on our triangle mesh surface that are closer to P than to any other point, uh, to, than to any other vertex. So in particular, what I'm going to say is the set of Q on our triangle mesh, M, with the property that P minus Q is less than or equal to P minus R for all uh, of the other vertices. So for all vertices R that are not equal to P. Right, so for example, within a single triangle, um, let's say, uh, let's see if I can manage to replicate the one here so it kind of looks like what uh, this, and then it goes down and across, something like that. The uh, Voronoi, essentially this triangle can be divided into three cells where what you do is you kind of draw three lines going inward from the three edges. I did a really poor job of that. And the Voronoi cell associated to this vertex is like the set of all points here, which are closer to that bottom vertex than to the other two guys. 
And similarly for these two cells, one thing that you can show quite easily is that uh, the boundaries of the Voronoi cells meet at 90 degree angles to the edges here, and they divide it into parts that may not be equal area. In fact, when your triangle is obtuse, the Voronoi cells can actually kind of leave the triangle. So in our pictures here, we're just going to worry about uh, triangle meshes where all the triangles are, are uh, acute or, or maybe have right angles. Uh, the obtuse case is actually a bit of a tricky one, um, which we might return to in a future lecture, but it's more of an implementation detail than anything else. Okay, so that's a Voronoi cell of a vertex of a triangle. A Voronoi cell of a vertex of a triangle mesh is just the union of Voronoi cells in the one ring of that vertex. Okay, so essentially what we're after is the integral of Gaussian curvature over the Voronoi cell of a vertex. Hopefully now that phrase kind of parses. And here's how we're going to do it. We can actually make use of the gauss binet theorem. So remember we have the uh, gauss binet theorem here. So we're looking for the uh, integral of Gaussian curvature oops, over our Voronoi cell. So that should be over V, my apologies. Uh, of Gaussian curvature uh, with respect to area. So now let's return to the gauss binet theorem for a second, and I'm going to take that geodesic curvature term, and I'm going to move it to the right-hand side. Okay, so we're going to have 2 pi times the Euler characteristic of the Voronoi cell around our vertex minus the integral over the boundary of our Voronoi cell of the geodesic curvature, ds. Okay, so I'm going to continue to <laughs> invoke a few math facts that we haven't actually covered in this course. Uh, so you're going to have to bear with me a little bit, and, and what's going to happen is it'll come together uh, as we, we talk about geodesics and some other constructions in differential geometry. But here's going to be our, our basic point. So now we're looking at this one ring picture. And we're trying to figure out how to approximate Gaussian curvature. And the way that we're going to do it is instead to approximate the right-hand side. So we need a couple pieces of information. The first one is, what is the Euler characteristic of the Voronoi cell? Right, so like this little, uh, what, hexagon that we, we, we have on the slide here. The dual cell in the language of a lecture from last week. And then in addition to that, we need to have some way of integrating geodesic curvature around the boundary of our Voronoi cell. So let's take care of these two things uh, one by one. So remember that the Euler characteristic is a topological invariant, and it's equal to V minus E plus F for polygons. So the uh, Voronoi cell, as you can see here, is basically just a disk. And so one simple version of a disk is a triangle that's filled in. Right, so this is topologically equivalent to the Voronoi cell, meaning that I can deform this thing into that Voronoi cell without making any, like, punching any holes um, and, and, and come up with some kind of mapping. Okay, so what is uh, our Euler characteristic in this case? It is equal to V minus E plus F. So for a triangle, there's three vertices, there's three edges, and there's one face. So overall, I get one. So... That leads us to believe that actually chi here is equal to 1 for this Voronoi cell that we've drawn on the slide. And uh, now we're, we're, we're getting into good shape here. So essentially, what do we have? So, so far we have really this is equal to 2 pi minus the uh, boundary integral. Sometimes people put a little circle here because it's on the boundary of the geodesic curvature ds. Okay. So now... How do we integrate curvature? Well, geodesic curvature is all the curvature that happens in the tangent plane to our surface. Okay, And one thing that we're going to prove later is that geodesic curves, like curves that are straight point, straight lines between two points, or not even straight lines, but like just the shortest path from point A to point B, uh, geodesic curves actually have zero geodesic curvature. And that actually makes sense, right? Because remember that we talked about how uh, geodesic curvature is kind of like how you're turning your steering, steering wheel as you drive along a surface. And if you're trying to get from one point to another efficiently, you shouldn't turn your steering wheel. You should just drive straight toward it. Yeah. So in fact, all of the geodesic curvature for the boundary of our cell V here happens 
at this interior point. It happens right there, right? So that's like where this uh, the bottom arrow is pointing toward. So in fact, for a polygonal Voronoi cell, like what I've drawn on this on the slide here, remember that we talked about integrated curvature along each one of these pairs of two half segments, right? And the integral, the integrated curvature we have in the tangent plane here, just invoking our lecture on planar curves, we define to be the turning angle, right? So it's actually two pi minus the sum of external exterior angles uh, epsilon i uh, in this figure. Okay, so now we have a discrete expression, but it's not a very convenient one because it's not clear what epsilon sub i is. But thankfully, uh, we can take care of that really easily. So now let's draw another little picture here. So I'm going to just draw this triangle again. So here's, here's a triangle. Okay, and so far we have a turning angle, which we've gotten by basically bisecting two edges and having them meet at some point, okay? So because we've bisected these two edges, we have two 90 degree angles at the top and the bottom, and we've defined this turning angle, which is equal to epsilon sub i. And we just want a more convenient notion of turning angle. Okay, so the four angles in a quadrilateral, you know, invoking your ninth grade geometry class, the four angles in a quadrilateral add up to what, 360 degrees? Yeah, you can double check this for a square. <laughs> or uh, so, so in other words, two pi. And we have two 90 degree angles. And if you think about it, so we've drawn a straight line here. If this is epsilon, then this interior angle here is pi minus epsilon i. So if we label this angle as theta, what is theta? Well, theta is equal to well, the total is 2 pi. We have two 90 degree angles. And then we have uh, uh, pi minus uh, epsilon i, like that. OK, oh, that's supposed to be at times. So what do we get? We get 2 pi minus pi is pi minus another pi. So now we've got 0. And what we're left with is that, pi, that theta i is equal to epsilon i. So in other words, our uh, integrated curvature value can equivalently be obtained by taking 2 pi and subtracting off the sum of interior angles theta i, like what I've shown you uh, in the image here. And let's kind of pause for a second and make sure that this is a sensible notion of curvature or at least integrated curvature, right? That's, that's where we started. Um, so for example, let's say that I take a totally flat domain. So just a bunch of triangles in the plane that meet at a point like that. Well, one thing that you might remember, well, is that the sum of angles around a point on the plane is just equal to 360 degrees or two pi uh, radians. So for Gaussian curvature, what are we gonna get? we're going to get 2 pi minus 2 pi, or 0. Yeah? So the integrated curvature in the one ring of this cell is just equal to 0. Similarly, you know, if I have a, uh, I don't know, a tetrahedron, so let's see if I can draw one like that. Okay, so we expect the uh, Gaussian curvature of this thing to be positive, right? Because a, a tetrahedron is kind of bowl-shaped. And indeed, if you think about it, when you sum up the three interior angles, one, two, and then there's like a third one cutting across the back, well, if you, you know, if you need to think about extremes, take these three points and move them really close together, you convince yourself that these angles get really, really small. <laughs> yeah. So you have 2 pi minus a small number, and you get a positive value for Gaussian curvature. Also, something a little bit interesting is that, well, you can't get like an unboundedly ginormous value of Gaussian curvature when it's integrated over the cell. I'll let you think about that one for a little bit. And now similarly, if you have a hyperbolic surface, right, so one way to get a hyperbolic surface might be to erase one edge in our, our one ring here and kind of insert a divot, right, so like some extra surface area. 
it's hard to draw, but like think of this vertex as kind of moved into the screen a little bit. Well, now I've essentially added to the theta i's, right? If I take some points and I just take one point and kind of drag it out of the plane, the two triangles adjacent to it got bigger. So what ends up happening? Well, now the integrated Gaussian curvature is negative, and that kind of makes sense because we have a saddle-shaped domain. So at least, you know, this, this notion is sensible. So th again, this is our simplification, that we can get integrated Gaussian curvature in the Voronoi cell around a vertex, which is uh, by, by essentially just taking 2 pi and subtracting off the sum of the interior angles. This argument should kind of remind you of how we got to that turning angle, th angle theorem before. They're, they're very similar uh, style constructions. And, and, and that's because they really are basically the same, the same argument. And notice that we also did a sleight of hand. I didn't tell you how to compute pointwise Gaussian curvature at vertices of a triangle mesh. I only told you how to compute the integral of Gaussian curvature over a very carefully chosen cell. Yeah, the Voronoi cell. Um, incidentally, again, the way that you compute the Voronoi cell is pretty straightforward. Uh, if you have a collection of edges around a, vertice, a vertex, like that, then the way that you obtain the Voronoi cell V is you bisect every edge in that one ring and then draw lines that are perpendicular to them, like that, and then you have your, your, your Voronoi cell. I'll let you convince yourself of that at home. It's basically a, a nice geometry uh, exercise. So it's the perpendicular bisectors. Your instructor always confuses, you know, the circumcenter versus the uh, in-center of a triangle, but this intersection point is one of those two. I, I always forget which one. In any event, essentially what we can do is flip things backward and say, okay, I'm going to define integrated curvature over my Voronoi region, V, to be equal to 2 pi minus the sum of interior angles. And what we can see is that this uh, formula here is going to kind of trivially satisfy a discrete Gauss-Binet formula. So for a little bit of review, actually if, well maybe I'll leave these formulas here for now. Uh, recall that the Euler characteristic of a triangulated mesh is vertices minus edges plus faces, which we haven't explicitly invoked in this math here, although kind of secretly we did somewhere in one of these steps. Uh, and this is a topological invariant of our domain. And we also, you might remember from our, our previous uh, lecture on just how to define surfaces, that you know we, we often make for closed triangle meshes this nice observation, which is two times the number of edges is equal to three times the number of faces. So now let's prove a really simple discrete version of the Gauss-Binet formula for triangle meshes without boundary. Okay, so here's how we can do it. Well, the integral of Gaussian curvature over our entire triangle mesh is equal to the sum of the integrals of Gaussian curvature over all the Voronoi cells, right? That's just saying that our mesh is a big union of Voronoi cells. Now, we can plug in the uh, formula that we just wrote down, or derived, kind of, sort of. And what we get is that. So now we have a sum over all the vertices of 2 pi minus the sum of interior angles at that vertex. Now the remainder of our discrete Gauss-Binet proof is just to rearrange these sums. So first of all, the first term ends up just being 2 pi times the number of vertices, right? Because that 2 pi doesn't depend on the index i at all, right? So it's just 2 pi times the number of terms in the sum. And we have a minus of a double sum of all the possible interior angles. So what is the sum over all possible interior angles? So currently, this is a sum over all vertices of our mesh, all of the interior angles adjacent to that vertex. So this double sum here is really the sum of all the interior angles of all the triangles in our mesh. Okay, but the sum of interior angles on one triangle is equal to pi, right? That's just sort of a high school geometry fact. So really, what we know is that that second term is equal to pi times the number of triangular faces on our domain. Now we're getting somewhere. Finally, let's factor out that pi. So we have pi times 2v minus f, which we showed for closed triangle meshes is equal to chi, the Euler characteristic. And here we have our discrete Gauss-Binet formula.
right? Like here's Gauss Binet in generality, and um, for closed domain, there is no boundary term. So there's our like kind of sort of QED uh, style term. And that's it. So there's a, a kind of nice structure preserving notion of integrated Gaussian curvature. Again, just like always, this is the Gaussian curvature integrated over the Voronoi cell. If I wanted an honest to goodness estimate of Gaussian curvature at that vertex, then I should really divide this value by the area of the Voronoi cell. And that makes sense, right? Because otherwise what can happen, you, you know, if you refine your triangle mesh to a smooth surface, you can convince yourself that this value will go to zero. But if you divide by the area, then it'll actually approach the, the Gaussian curvature, which is what you want. Um, there's a typical bug in code, like somebody will implement this formula and use it for Gaussian curvature, but that's not quite right. It's integrated Gaussian curvature, so you get an estimate by dividing by the size of the Voronoi cell. Okay, so let's uh, erase this and then keep going. Okay, so we've tried our hand at deriving a structure-preserving notion of Gaussian curvature. and the remainder of our discussion, we're going to do the same thing for mean curvature. So, um, right. So if you recall, uh, one thing that we showed about curves is that when we move in the curvature-weighted normal direction, this actually corresponds to somehow moving in the uh, gradient of arc length direction. Um, and that's something that we uh, prove on the homework. And I also did basically for you in one of those extra lecture segments. And then in the latest extra lecture segment, um, we also derived a more complicated version of the same fact, um, which is that if you take a gradient of surface area, you get the mean curvature weighted normal uh, to your surface. And in particular, if you do the gradient descent procedure until you get to zero, um, you end up with a domain called a minimal surface. So my colleague Keenan Crane has done a really nice job of illustrating what minimal surfaces look like. They're um, typically hyperbolic. If you think about mean curvature equals zero, that kind of makes sense because one principal curvature has to be positive and the other negative. Um, and they really are, are just basically bubbles, right? Like so, so bubble surfaces are minimal surfaces because bubbles want to spread out, you know, minimize surface area as much as possible. So to come up with some structure preserving notion of mean curvature, one thing we could do is start from this fact, which is going to be easily discretized and then make it work on a triangular mesh domain. So in particular, if we have V vertices on a triangle mesh, then we can think of area as a function from R to the 3V into R1. <laughs> so essentially R to the 3V here is saying that there's a position in 3D of every vertex of every triangle on this mesh, and then knowing the positions of all the vertices and keeping the topology fixed, we can output the area of the mesh as a function of that long list of vertex positions. So what we're going to do is just an analogy to this sort of mean curvature gradient relationship here. We're going to do the same thing by just taking the gradient of this area functional that maps from vertex positions into surface area. And thankfully, well, surface area is just the sum over all the triangles of triangle areas, so we can do that with pretty classical style reasoning. So let's get started. So here on the uh, upper right, I've given you a triangle. <laughs> Uh, this is going to be the uh, object that we're working with. And in particular, we're going to put the triangle in a really convenient uh, reference frame for the three vertices. So what I'm going to do, because I don't need to copy it on the left since it'll persist on the uh, slide here, is I'm going to set up a coordinate system of three orthogonal and unit length directions. One of them is going to be parallel to the bottom ev edge of our triangle. That's the vector E on the bottom. One of them is going to be perpendicular to E, but in the triangle plane. That's this E perp that you see on the top. And then a third direction, N, is going to be the normal direction to the triangle. And this is an orthonormal basis, and it stays fixed. We're not going to move it around. OK, so now we're going to take a point P on the top of our triangle, and we can write it in this coordinate system, right? So it's equal to the part in the normal direction plus the part in the edge direction plus the part in the edge perp direction. This is just XYZ coordinates in a, again, a coordinate system I chose to make my calculation as easy as possible. OK, so of course, one thing that we know is that we can compute the area as 1 half base times height. <laughs> 
right? That's our uh, favorite formula in uh, high school geometry, which is equal to one half times the width of our uh, triangle, the base, times its height, where uh, just to make sure that we're all on the same page here, uh, if we have a triangle uh, like this, for a second I was struggling to draw a triangle, right? Then the base is down here, and the height of the triangle is the length of this thing that we drop down at 90 degrees, like that. Okay, and in particular, in our picture here, our goal is going to be, remember that we're trying to differentiate area with respect to the positions of vertices of a triangle? So I'm going to differentiate area of this triangle with respect to just the top vertex, P. Okay, and by construction, the area of P, well, it's equal to one-half times the base times the height. And the height of the triangle, you can convince yourself, is actually... Uh, can be written as a pretty nice expression. So it's equal to the square root of p n squared plus p perp squared. You might notice that there is not a p e <laughs> uh, term here, and that's because remember that the height of the triangle is the length of p projected onto the plane uh, between n and e perp, right? Because the b term is already taking care of everything parallel to the bottom edge. Okay, and we're going to think of A as really just a function of that vertex P. And the question is, as we perturb P, what happens to the area of our triangle? Sorry, this is a messy letter A. It's supposed to be a letter A. And I'm not making it better by rewriting it many times. <laughs> okay, so essentially what we have to do is compute the gradient of this expression. And in order to do that, I am going to glance at my notes. Okay, so in particular... What is uh, the, we have to take the gradient with respect to the three coordinates, Pn, Pe, and P perp. Now the easiest one is Pe, because it doesn't appear in this expression, right? So the, gradient, the derivative of area with respect to Pe, it's supposed to be an E, <laughs> thanks, I'm struggling today, is equal to zero. Okay, and now the other two are a little bit more tricky. So uh, let's take the partial derivative of area with respect to, which one do I want to do next? How about Pn? Well, we have this expression here, right? So it's 1 half times the base. Now what ends up happening? You get 1 half times this thing to the 1 half times the uh, derivative of what's in the inside, right? And the derivative of what's in the inside is 2p. So the 2's cancel. And what we end up with is Pn divided by the square root pn squared plus p perp squared. Okay. And then uh, we get the same, basically exactly the same thing happens for p perp, right? Because it's, it's basically the same expression. So we have da uh, dp perp is equal to one half times the base times p perp divided by uh, pn squared plus P per square. Okay, so this is a general set of formulas for our different partial derivatives, but uh, we're particularly interested in the derivative only when P starts out in its initial pose, which is what we've drawn on the slide here. And notice that uh, by definition, P is in the plane that's spanned by E and E perp. So in particular, Pn is equal to zero in this initial pose. So really, this whole derivative is equal to zero. OK, so what does that mean? Well, if we put these three things together, right? so we know that the gradient of area is equal to the partial derivative in the e direction times e, plus the partial derivative in the n direction times n, plus the partial derivative in the p perp direction uh, times this quantity here. So essentially, what that's telling us is that the only thing that we have to worry about is this last quantity here. And in particular, remember that Pn is equal to zero. So what that's going to end up with is the square root of P perp squared. So that's just P perp. Those cancel. We get 1 half B. So in other words, what we've shown is that the gradient with respect to P of our area is equal to 1 half the length of the base times uh, the vector E perp. Okay. So that, I believe, is shown on the next slide here. Yeah, so 
Good, I've, I'm doing math over here and it agrees with what's on my laptop. <laughs> okay, so, so far uh, we can summarize what we've, we've done by, by writing the expressions here. So in general, for a triangle where I'm going to set up this very convenient coordinate system with uh, the bottom edge, the orthogonal complement to the bottom edge in the triangle plane and the normal to the triangle. The area in general as a function of p can be written as, as what I've, I've shown in the second row. And in the third row, I've taken the gradient of, p, of area with respect to p evaluated at the original point p. So the, the point is just getting perturbed out of that plane. All right, so now we're gonna derive another convenient formula here. And by the way, this is just kind of a fun formula to know from trigonometry anyway. And that's the ratio of the base of a triangle to the height of a triangle. So here we have a triangle and H, this, uh, this vertical line, is meeting the base of the triangle at 90 degrees. Okay, so I'm going to subdivide the bottom edge of the triangle into two segments, one of length L1 and another segment of length L2 and the height of my triangle is h. I've also written two angles, alpha and beta. <laughs> okay, and here's kind of a little known trigonometric formula that I think is kind of cool, which is to give us the ratio of the base to the height of a triangle. So that looks like base divided by height. Well, the length of the base here is L1 plus L2. So of course that's L1 over height plus L2 over height, like that. Okay, so what is L1 over height? So if you remember, you know, what is it? Soka, Towa, uh, and then, then to compute cotangent of alpha, right? So tangent is opposite over adjacent. So cotangent is adjacent over op opposite. Right, so cotangent of alpha is L1 over Use H. Information. Oops, yikes. And cotangent of beta is L2 over H. Okay, so L1 over H is cotangent of alpha and L2 over H is cotangent of beta. So that's just kind of a fun fact that the sum of cotangents is equal to the ratio of base to height. And in fact, we can actually make our picture a little finer than that. So now we're gonna step up our game a tiny bit <laughs> and we're going to define a height vector H. So the height vector points perpendicular to the bottom of our triangle straight up and into the point P. I'm going to label the base of that, the, that perpendicular vector P naught, and the rest of our picture remains the same, but I've labeled the two vertices of our triangle Q and R in addition to P at the top. So the question is, what is this height vector, this vector that points from bottom to top? Well, we can write this height vector, maybe I put the little vector sign on top just to disambiguate from the H I wrote here, right? And this is really equal to P minus P zero, right? That's just based on the picture that I've drawn. Now, here's the kind of fun thing. I can write P zero in terms of all the quantities that I've labeled on this image here, right? In particular, P zero is sort of a weighted average of Q and R, where the weights have to do with the ratio of L1 and L2 to the whole length of the edge. Right? So I can say the following, that this is really equal to P minus, I'm gonna try and do this without looking at my notes, which is always a mistake. So for example, let's say that L2 is equal to the whole length of the uh, row, right? the whole length of the bottom edge. So if L2 is equal to the length of the bottom edge, that means that P0 is equal to Q, right? So in other words, we can think of it as like L2 over L1 plus L2. So if L1 is zero, well, then I'm at Q, right? So, so that should be like that, plus L1 divided by L1 plus L2 times uh, R, right? And this is kind of like just, uh, you can think of it like very centric coordinates or just weighted averages. You know, I'm just sliding a point P0 between Q and R, and these are the averaging weights because they have to do with the proportions of the length of our bottom edge here. Hopefully I've done that right. I am gonna glance at my notes. I'm sorry, not that sorry. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take these two fractions here and we're gonna just divide them by the height of our triangle on the top and the bottom. We can always do that, right? So it's L2 over H, um, L1 over H, L2 over H, and so on. 
The reason to do that is that no, these look like cotangents, right? So in particular, what we've shown is that this is equal to P minus, okay, so L2 over H is the cotangent of beta times, so that's divided by cotangent alpha plus cotangent beta. And then we have a similar term here, but now we have uh, cotangent of alpha divided by the same sum. By the way, there are shorter proofs of this formula, but I think this one identifies a lot of kind of fun trigonometric identities, so I, I tend to put it in. Okay, so for our next trick here, what we're going to do is we're going to start with our uh, formula for the gradient, and we're going to use these two expressions here to make it a little bit tidier. Okay, so again, so this is our formula star here. We're going to say, uh, can I manage to write it in the bottom of our, our page here? Well, I think I, I can try. So by star, Well, we know that the gradient with respect to P of the area of our triangle is equal to one half base times uh, E perp, right? So this is one half B E perp, just like that. And what is E perp? Well, in some sense, it's H divided by its norm, right? That's, that's all that we're, we're doing here, okay? So again, I can write this as one half B divided by the norm of the height vector, which is this h value here, times the height vector, right? And essentially, remember, that's just because e perp is equal to h divided by the norm of h. Now, I'm going to plug in our two expressions here. What do I get? Well, b over h is cotangent alpha plus cotangent beta, which conveniently cancels out the denominators here. So I get that this is equal to one half times the following. So we have cotangent alpha plus cotangent beta, and all of that times p minus, uh, oops, I forgot a q here, uh, cotangent beta times q minus cotangent alpha times r like that. Okay. And finally, I can uh, factor this expression a slightly different way because notice that I have a P minus R times cotangent alpha, and I have a P minus Q times cotangent beta, right? So at the end of the day, this, ah, uh, just barely going to fit it here, is one half. And now let's pull out cotangent alpha. times P minus R plus cotangent beta times P minus Q. Now, returning to our picture here, this is kind of a funny expression, right? So remember that P minus R and P minus Q, those are just two edges of our triangle. <laughs> so that's pretty good shape. And what do they get weighted by? So P minus R gets weighted by cotangent of the opposite alpha, and similarly for P minus Q. Okay, so this is summarized on this much tidier slide in case you can't read my bad handwriting. <laughs> but this uh, derivation here is identical to what we just wrote on the bottom of our page. And again, essentially what it's saying is that at the end of the day, if I want to differentiate area with respect to the position of a vertex, I can get that as a weighted average of the two edges adjacent to that vertex, P minus R and P minus Q, where the weights come from cotangent of the opposite angle. Now, this is one of these funny things where in geometry processing research, this cotangent function shows up all over the place, which is kind of funny because I feel like you don't spend a whole lot of time on cotangent in uh, trigonometry in high school, but, you know, that's life. Okay. <laughs> 
So that's our basic expression for how to differentiate the area of a triangle with respect to one of its vertices. Notice that we chose a really convenient coordinate system, but by the end we managed to get rid of it. <laughs> um, so this is written just in terms of the positions of the vertices and the interior angles, which is pretty nice and really what we were aiming for. Now, of course, we don't want to just differentiate a single triangle's area with respect to uh, a vertex. We want to differentiate the area of a triangle mesh with respect to the position of a vertex. So that looks something like this. So obviously a single vertex is just connected to its one ring. So if I talk about differentiating the area of a mesh with respect to a vertex, that's really like differentiating the area of a one ring with respect to a vertex, which is what I'm showing you here. Right? So all I've done is taken this formula I have at the bottom of our blackboard here and just summed it over all of the outgoing edges in a one ring of a vertex, and what I get is this formula here. So the weight of every edge, if I regroup where instead of doing it by triangle, I do it by edge, the weight of the edge like P minus QJ gets two cotangents, one from either opposite angle. And that's just based on rearranging this formula here after we sum it over the one ring of the vertex P. Okay, so again, to summarize what we've done so far, if I want to take the gradient of the area of a triangle mesh with respect to a vertex P, the way that I should do it is by writing this sum which appears at the top of the slide here. So essentially what the sum is telling us is that I'm going to take a weighted sum of the outgoing edges from vertex P where the weight of an edge is equal to the sum of the, co to the two cotangents that are opposite that edge. Now one thing that you can observe here is that actually as you refine a mesh, like you make the triangle smaller, well clearly P minus Q gets smaller and smaller and smaller and the cotangents it turns out don't explode. Uh, so what you end up getting is a smaller fine gradient. That kind of makes sense actually because if you have really tiny triangles then you can't affect surface area by moving one vertex quite as much. Okay, so I'm going to erase some of these scribbles so I have somewhere to stand and then we'll continue. Okay, so now that we have this nice formula, uh, typically what we do is we, we kind of flip things backward and we say that we can make a definition which is of the integrated mean curvature normal. Well, remember the mean curvature normal is the first variation of surface area. We're going to say the integrated mean curvature normal over the Voronoi region around a vertex is equal to exactly the quantity that we just defined. Now, the reason that we can think of it like integrated is that when I move a vertex, I don't just make an infinitesimal change to my surface. I, fix, I affect in a positive way all the vertices in the one ring of that, 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 or rather all the triangles in the one ring of that vertex by a positive amount. So this really is some kind of a curvature um, estimate. And then it turns out that dividing by area does give you a reasonable estimate for mean curvature. Notice incidentally in both of these last two things that we did, right? So this version of mean curvature and uh, our version of um, Gaussian curvature obtained by summing up interior angles. Even though we define curvature initially by computing the second fundamental form and taking its eigenstructure, we didn't actually end up doing that in either of these computations. And, and that's really because we chose one of many ways to introduce those two really critical values and, and some of the other ones could be motivated without ever making reference to that fundamental form. So again, the pipeline that we've sort of proposed here is that you can compute integrated uh, mean and Gaussian curvatures by using the formulas that we've laid out, which are just like sums over one rings. And then if you want some estimated pointwise value, you can divide by the area of the Voronoi cell. So I would argue that the, the structure that really does have, that is preserved is, is mainly hiding the first bullet here. The second one is a little bit more of like a divided difference approximation. No, there are all kinds of other discrete mean and Gaussian curvatures out there. So for example, another formula out there for uh, mean curvature tries to integrate it along um, geodesic curves and then you can end up with yet another definition which is using some triangulation applications. So if you're interested in this particular formula which is kind of obtained by like integrating over a tiny little cylindrical piece of a surface that um, is illustrated here, uh, I refer you to this textbook that I've, I've referenced in the slides. And, you know, there are other ones out there too. So, for example, 
Uh, there's some variational problems like smoothing that can require curvature measures. In that case, you might want something kind of stable, differentiable. So there's a nice research paper out there um, by uh, some of the usual suspects in discrete differential geometry for giving shape operators in, in this particular case. Um, or if I just want a robust estimate, uh, that there, there's methods out there that do that too. So most of the ones that we've discussed in lecture today, notice that they just involve a vertex and it's one ring. Um, if you want a more robust estimate of curvature with probably a little bit less preserved structure, one way to do that is maybe to include larger ring neighborhoods of a vertex in your curvature estimate. Like for example, fitting a little surface locally and then taking its curvature. That's robust, right? You're sort of incorporating more data at every vertex. But notice that it's a little bit strange in the sense that curvature is a derivative. You shouldn't need a big neighborhood to compute it. So as always, there's a trade-off between robustness and, and fidelity. And of course, these are just a few of many other strategies. You could locally fit a smooth surface to its vertex and its neighbors. You could write down a different formula. You know, Maybe it's a, a, some function of curvature. And you can choose where to place the different values on the triangle mesh and, and analyze the convergence. Then finally, there actually are some methods in the last couple of years that try to learn curvature computation. So maybe I only have a noisy piece of geometry in front of me. And I'm trying to learn this differential quantity um, by looking at the geometry, inferring the smooth surface underneath it, and then outputting its uh, curvature. I think this is sort of an emerging strategy, one that's not super popular, but you never know. We'll see what arises in the future. So my practical advice for those of you who have confused by giving a million different operations that you could use that all give you estimates of, of curvature is to try as many as you can. Many of them are just formulas on a mesh. They're not terribly complicated. So you might as well implement all the ones that you think are relevant to your application and see which one performs best in practice. So with that, we've concluded our discussion of curvature, which is sort of our very first useful quantity that we can compute on a uh, triangulated domain. And we'll continue in this course next by talking about other things that we can do on surfaces, namely computing distances and curves between different pairs of points. So with that, I'll talk to you next time.